follow this with some educational content about the carrier grade capabilities of LoRaWAN that some of you may or may not be aware of today. Speaking from TechTelic will be president and co-founder Roman Nemish. Roman brings many years of RF engineering experience to this event. And if you've ever interacted with Roman in person or on LinkedIn, you know that he's very passionate and very knowledgeable about this technology and can provide some outstanding insight. After this, Senate will discuss the ecosystem from an operator's point of view by providing some information about deploying a network and giving some insight into some real use cases that have been deployed in the market today. Speaking on behalf of Senate today is Steve Ball. Steve is currently the Senior Director of Consulting Services at Senate. He leads the mission to deliver a suite of services branded the Senate IoT Foundry with an objective of accelerating time to market for LoRaWAN sensor-based solutions. And Steve will be speaking about a few of these successful deployments today. And then finally at the end, we will have some time uh, to answer some questions. So I encourage all of you to use the Q&A function on your screen to submit your questions throughout the presentation. And while I can't guarantee that we'll get to every question today, we will certainly do our best and we'll absolutely follow up after the event from anything that's left outstanding. So to kick things off, I'm going to hand the controls over to Semtech. Vivek, can you, can you hear us? Yep, thanks, Jack. Okay, um, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, thanks everyone for attending this webinar. Uh, my name is Vivek. I'll be taking you through a quick introduction of uh, LoRa and some of the vertical segments that we see uh, traction in. Trying to figure out how to move these slides forward. Um, Here, Vivek, I'll just control the slides for you. There you go. Vivek, are you still there? Hello, Vivek. This is Jack Stewart back here now. Are you guys all able to hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, but Vivek is no longer online, I don't believe. Vivek, can you hear us? Okay, so what I'm going to do while we get, until we get Vivek back, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Uh, apologies for the for the uh, technical difficulties here. We're going to skip ahead to TechTelic. Um, speaking on behalf of TechTelic, like I mentioned, is Roman Nemish. Roman is going to present a little bit about uh, the carrier grade capabilities of LoRaWAN. So I'm going to turn things over to Roman now and we'll try and get Vivek back on for later in the presentation. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, just want to make sure that everybody can hear me clearly as well because I'm mobile at this moment as well. Jack? Yep, you sound great, Roman. Excellent, thank you. And I'm getting feedback through the chat line that everyone can hear you well. Okay, thank you so much. 
So I can you give me the control? Yeah, you should have it. Okay. Okay. So um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, again, 15 minutes is not enough time to present uh, care great products or discuss in all details what really entitles when we talked about the care great products, but we'll try to do our best. And uh, when I will speak right now about care grade products, I'll try to pull in my experience developing wireless products uh, in the past for one of the larger tier one companies and the last nine years or so developing again tier one quality products for a number of tier one vendors around the world in companies such as, you know, um, you know Nokia, Nokia, Ericsson or, or that caliber companies and deploying those products across the globe. Um, Tectelic spent a lot of time developing uh, uh, custom products for the last nine years um, and the last three years or so we actually invested heavily in uh, IOT uh, space in specifically into LoRa as well as NVIOT so Tectelic can be very um, frank in these discussions because um, we we believe there's a value in both but we definitely see today LoRa is much much ahead of the of the other technologies so um, Looking at the typical architecture of the of the uh, LoRa WAN, and I don't want to really go down into, we'll call it a very simple um, discussions, but I want to just kind of outline that when we look today at the typical LoRa WAN architecture, you know, we, we discuss everything from the devices what we call sensors. Uh, look in the left hand side, and then there's a gateways. Then there's a concept of a network server um, that everybody discusses today, and then the applications, if you will, or you may also call analytics and actions. Um, under the network server, I outlined a few more elements because the network server itself is the function that is really a part of the LoRaWAN, but there are other servers that are being built in and will be added as value added. And some of them are called geolocation servers, there are OM server, there's a billing server, and there will be other servers as well um, to complement, if you will, to build the carry grade networks. Um, what I'm trying to show in this slide is there's a multiple gateways and a multiple devices. And what I'm trying to really represent that if somebody really wants to build a carrier grade product or carrier grade networks, which we'll show in other slides, you can really build that with a one kind of a gateway or one kind of a sensor uh, because it's just not the way the networks are built. So if you look at the 2G, 3G, 4G networks, or even 5G now, you will, you will see that typically the networks are deployed by initially deploying kind of a macro scale deployments, and that's to give everybody coverage. And then over time, when, when users see there is a certain coverage and they can roam or whatever it is, people start adding more and more capacity, and that's done by introducing more base stations or gateways or, you know, like we call cell dividing or, or just adding more like, you know, we'll call it micro cells to increase the capacity. The same applies to LoRa. So there is no really any different, you know, uh, there isn't maybe the terminology is slightly different, but the concept of deploying nationwide coverage is done the same way um, with LoRa as it is with the wireless technologies. Maybe there's an, an advantage to a degree because somebody can scale LoRa networks from a very low cost. I mean, certain enterprises can deploy a LoRa network in a small town or maybe even in a parking lot in some kind of a, you know, uh, a large parking lot or a hospital. You don't really need to have a nationwide coverage in order to deploy a network and actually uh, provide value to the consumer. What I'm also trying to show on this slide is looking, you know, so there are certain gateways looking from the bottom up, you know, we call them either peak or micro gateways. And they're kind of built to be indoor coverage. We'll talk about more details. Then there's a macro gateways, the second one up. And there means they're typically outdoor, but they're fully integrated. Everything is fully integrated. So we have a seller backhaul, we have GPS. It's all designed to be very easy to deploy, more like a farmer or maybe some kind of enterprise. They'll just put the gateway in a pole and they have a instant coverage. Then there's a macro gateways, or sorry, mega gateways, what we call it's a it's a slightly another one. And you can tell this is kind of becoming a larger gateway, so it has more capacity, more coverage, more performance, more features, and, and with that, it's kind of a, in, introduces the concept of there's a more carrier greatness to it, which we'll discuss in more details. And then there's actually a fourth one right at the top, um, and we'll go into details, but that one particular one is a mobile gateway. And that one is to really assist to deploy LoRaWAN coverages, if you will, on demand. So the concept of, in a seller world, there's a concept of, you know, cow 
call it, or, or sell on wheels. Well, this is a similar thing. This is a gateway. It can be on wheels. It can be on a, on a ship. It can be on a plane. It can be on a train. And if you need to provide you know, coverage at that particular time, you can just deploy this product. And you have to build a certain way to deploy it. What I'm trying to show is, at the same slide here, is that, you know, if you will, on the devices, the coverage and the, and the number of devices connected grows if you go from the micro pico to macro to mega to mobile gateway. Um, I'm not going to spend more time on this slide, just, you know, you can, you know, review it. And the concept of the LoRa, it really goes between the, between the sensor and the gateway, the LoRa interface. Between the LoRa gateway and the network server, you know, that's where the LoRa WAN protocol is defined, and it's typically communicated between MQTT or UDP. And then from the network server or geolocation server or ONM server, billing server, other servers there, we're talking analytics. The key thing to understand here is the user experience. The user, at the end of the day, only has visibility to those graphs or those actions that we provide them with. And the user experience would be depending not on the, just an app that they see. The user experience will highly depend on the network and the device and the coverage they get. If, they, if the user doesn't feel it's adding value, they will not adopt this technology or any other technology. And it's very important to understand that that user experience depends all the way, all the way to the left to the end device. And we have to make sure when we build the products, we keep that in mind. So going to the next slide, um, this is really, I try to focus here on the gateways. I'm just trying to explain to people or maybe to the team here um, why there are multiple gateways and what's the reason to have multiple gateways. Because clearly, you know, somebody has to invest a lot of money and resources um, uh, and time to actually build multiple gateways. But in order to, to provide a true, true, we'll call it here, great networks, um, one has to do that, or you know, maybe multiple companies have to do it. And the reason for that is because in order to have the most cost-effective deployments for outdoor uh, networks, you know, or we'll call the outdoor deployments, we need to have outdoor gateways. And there could be different, you know, scale. There could be different power levels, you know, regulated by certain industry standards. Um, but they also mean different conditions. That's kind of important to realize that it's hard to build one product that meets all deployment conditions. And it could be because of where you want to mount this product or what kind of performance you'd like to get. When we look at the indoor deployment, it's been proven over and over. And, you know, it's not, again, just because of LoRa. It's been proven in 2G, 3G, and, you know, 5, 4G, and now will be 5G, that indoor deployment is always the most cost effective with the indoor products. Mm -hmm. And that's why people had even depleted, deployed repeaters, not even small cells when they were cost effective before, but people deployed repeaters um, or distributed antenna systems in buildings for many years. And, and in order to actually provide, as I said, on-demand coverage, one should really consider early on to deploy mobile gateways because those actually are very good opportunities in order to provide the coverage or provide the gap where there's no coverage or it might be no, no, no economical to deploy um, um, an, a network at early on days. Focusing on outdoor gateways because that's typically the first product we deploy in it. When we deploy or customers deploy the outdoor gateways, it's very important to make sure that we think how this product is going to be deployed and maintained in the field. It's not something that it's easy to deploy and replace tomorrow. When we deploy outdoor products, we always think they have to be deployed and stay in the field 10 years, 10 to 15 years. That's a minimum lifespan of these products. Um, in a seller industry, 10 to 15 years is the standard. So the MTBF of these products have to be 15 plus years. That becomes the standard. Also, you don't want to deploy the product that only covers sub-band or just partial band. You want to deploy, make sure this product is capable of supporting the entire RSM band and it's capable to support the maximum number of channels because maybe today demand is not there, but in a year or two, the demand will be there and it's going to be very expensive to replace it. The replacement of these products alone will cost much more than the gateway themselves. So in North America, you know, a typical you know, replacement cost, climbing a tower, if it's a very tall tower, could easily overcome the cost of the gateway. Um, then the other element is, you know, so we want to make sure we have maximum number of receive transmit channels. The best number is typically, you know, cover the entire ISM band and maximize that. 
we want to we want to support diversity antenna diversity is transmit receive and there's benefits to to both of them and that is again when we deploy large scale products it's very important to have reliable channels and channels you know in a, maybe in an open field um, you, one can actually manage with one antenna um, but you do get benefit with two antennas for geolocation other aspects but if you if you're deploying products in a in a urban deployments or even suburban deployments, then two antennas will provide significant benefit because of the because of the fading. Like if it's a rally fading channel, you'll get you know six to eight dB uh, benefit on the receive side having a diversity channels. The other element I'm trying to outline here, kind of a very practical, outdoor products must be IP67. It means you no, know, they cannot they have to be watertight. If they put if you put them under water one meter, they should not take any water. Uh, for extended period of time. They must support typically minus 40 degrees Celsius to plus 60 and cold start. What cold start really means, it means you put the product in a minus 40 degrees Celsius, you power it down, you leave it there overnight at minus 40 degrees Celsius, you come back the next morning, you apply power, and the product should start up and operate. And if it doesn't, then that's a problem because, you know, maybe in many regions, that's not an issue, but in many northern regions like Canada, you know, in nor northern European regions, that is a real test. And it's very common that when it's cold, the power will go out. And when the power goes out, and then, you know, maybe two or three or five hours later will, will come back up. If the product is not designed for these environments, it will not start. This is not a test that just works. If you did not design the product, the power will just, you know, the system will not even come up. The other element, which I'll call more details here, and the reason I want to point on that, today there we've seen a lot of systems that are being deployed without what we call cavity filters, or really uh, means uh, filters that have a very high IQ and very steep rejection. And you know that might work, just like in a maybe in a wireless world, uh, WiMAX people deploying base stations for a while for some period of time when you have a very small number of devices. But once you start deploying more and more devices, you will people will start realizing that the interference caused by other systems that are co-located um, will be impacting the performance of the LoRaWAN networks. And I think it's important to overcome that day one and make sure that the right equipment with the RF conditioning is deployed next to the antenna because that's the only way to operate um, um, uh, wireless networks. There is no today a single base station, 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, in the world deployed by Ericsson, Nokia, Huawei, any company without RF filters next to the antenna. It's very, if it's an outdoor product and if it's mounted on towers, on buildings, it must have proper RF conditioning. Um, I cannot stress more than all protection should be built in the product. It's not a care grade product when you have to add quarter way stops and all the protection outside the product. It actually doesn't even work because if you have a lightning strike and you have a protection outside of the product, well, there's no guarantee that that protection is going to be even uh, functional. So all protection always has to be, must be built inside the product. That's the only way to ensure that you have proper protection and withstand you know, either lightning strikes or some other surges uh, that your product can experience in these deployments. The other elements I'm showing here is probably not, maybe it's a diff huge differentiation what we're seeing today in the marketplace. Um, the nanosecond clocks is something that's really important if somebody wants to perform very accurate geolocation. It's very important to have a GPS with a holdover because it also guarantees you to have a very stable systems. And I obviously already mentioned about 15 year MTBF for all outdoor products. The indoor gateways are much smaller, much more cost effective, and they have a different application. They are there to provide indoor coverage because that is the most cost-effective way to do it. So what's important? Well, it's important to have enough channels to make sure we can receive all the, you know, all the devices without really much of the, um, uh, of the interference. So it doesn't really justify to potentially deploy an FTD system or full duplex system. A TDD system works just as well. But it's key to make sure this product is a plug and play. It is self-configured. And in many cases, it should be battery, it should have a battery backup and, and seller backhaul. And the reason for that is it's just ease of deployment and, and reliability for the network. When we look at the mobile gateway, again, um, without too many details, it is on-demand coverage. 
it should be also supporting entire ISM band because the user might deploy it in any position. They might start on the East Coast, United States, and travel all the way to the West Coast, and they need to make sure they cover all the, all the frequency, all the channels in the deployment. Um, one element that the mobile stations have to withstand, it's a very harsh operating conditions. It's not an outdoor product because this product is mounted on vehicles, airplanes, ships, you know, trains. There's lots of vibration. There's lots of, um, um, it's high temperature, it's potentially oil. It's designed to really operate like it can be mounted in a vehicle next to the, to, to the, to the motor or engine. Um, and one element that I think is very important for these products typically make sure it supports very wide power ranges. And clearly it has to support multiple backhaul options because, you know, in some cases, you know, people will, will, uh, will backhaul it through a cellular network. In other cases, they'll be using even the satellite networks. So going to the next slide, and I want to make sure I speed up so I'm not, um, not going to... Uh, uh, <clears throat> so what do we mean by we stay in care great uh, IoT networks? And again, it's, uh, it's not specifically to LoRa. It really applies to any kind of a network. Well, first and most of all, it means the networks have to have a very high reliability and dependability. And those two numbers mean slightly different things. One of them means the product has to be very reliable. So it has to have 15 year of MTBF or so. And dependability, it means it has to have very high availability. And it's typically five nines. So five nines translates into, into five, I think about five minutes per year. Uh, six nines will translate into obviously uh, 0.5 minutes per year. It's very difficult to build a product that will meet six nines, but it's, it's, it's feasible to build networks, obviously, of a five nine availability. And that's probably the key element typically of a carry grade. Next, the networks have to be very secure, both at the network level, at the gateway level, at the device level. As we discussed, these networks have to be scalable. We don't want to build a product that, that we deploy day one in the network with a certain product. And then when we have to add more capacity, we have to go and replace the gateways. The goal typically of carry grade networks is you deploy the product and it's there for 10 years until technology completely changes or the product is completely depreciated. The other element of availability of product and especially um, uh, coverage is it's a long range and it's a in deep indoor coverage, deep penetration. Those are very important. Those are very important things for these applications. We will just touch, tiny, uh, touch base on the co-location requirements because um, it's one of the elements that, that we've, as I mentioned, we find sometimes being skipped or overlooked. And I think it's very important for the future to ensure these products are addressed, um, the networks are addressed and have proper coverage. The versatile deployments and maybe operation conditions kind of a weird mention to it, but it really comes down to when you deploy in a product, you have to make sure you do a four corner testing. You test your products at hot and cold temperatures, extreme hot and cold temperatures and extreme voltage you know, variations. Those two elements will define a lot of issues that are hiding between software, firmware, and hardware. And unless somebody perform all the testing over an extended period of time um, and have done some kind of selected life test, it's really, it's really difficult to know what kind, of, what kind of conditions a product might fail in the field over a period of time. And last but not least, it's very important to have a very high quality and comprehensive O&M because O&M, how you manage the networks, is the element that makes, that defines the total cost of ownership. It is not really the gateway cost or even the devices cost that will define the overall network cost. It is how these networks are managed. Um, I'm not going to, I'm going to just because of a lack of time here, um, the frequency division duplex and time division duplex outlines here very briefly, you know, what's the FTD, what's the TDD. In North America, there is enough spectrum to deploy a frequency division duplex. And we believe that all outdoor gateways will have a huge benefit if they are frequency division duplex because a user can transmit and receive at the same time all the time. And um, maybe just very briefly to outline the need for cavity filters. Um, cavity filters will allow systems to operate 
in the environment that's shown on this left-hand side currently where there's a lot of interference um, notice specifically North American band on the on the on the left hand side you can see there's a cellar base stations being received by the LoRa uh, LoRa gateway antenna on the on the right hand side of this uh, spectrum on the higher frequency we can see there's a fixed mobile uh, uh, networks and their power is so high that it's actually saturating the front end of these gateways and without the filters like these sharp filters one would really have a hard time receiving or have reliable networks. And it is particularly these what people refer to as cavity filters or high IQ filters that are needed to make sure that the gateways are going to be reliable and perform very well in all deployment conditions. And just to kind of to maybe close it in here, um, the, when we talk about the carrier grade net sorry, carrier grade networks, that doesn't mean just the gateways or the network server, it also means devices. Because at the end, the user experience will depend not just on the network and the gateway, but also on the devices. So some of the key elements of the, of the, of the devices today is they have to be really easy to onboard, provision, configure, and maintain. So they have to be really plug and play. It has to be as simple as, as uh, you know, as a printer. You go to buy a printer, you bought the printer, you brought it home, you plug it in and it gets configured, connects to your laptop and prints. Um, they have to operate these devices and be reliable in all conditions. And it means, you know, they have to be measure what they're intended to measure and operate in cold, hot, wet environments. And it, you know, that, that is a difficult task for a low cost product in many cases. It's very important to make sure these devices have a, the best possible RF performance for their price, because a device that doesn't have a good RF performance is never going to be reliable. Mm -hmm. The key is to maintain not just low cost of the device, but actually low cost of connectivity, because over time, connectivity is going to cost a lot more than the device itself. And probably one of the, you know, one of the key elements that everybody's stressing today, and I don't want to outline and say it's not an issue, is battery life. It's if unless one is providing three to five year guarantee battery life, it's not going to be a carrier grid network if you have to replace batteries once a month or once a year. We believe these are at least five key points that, that we are focusing today when we're building the devices themselves. I think I would like to close on this and I'll take questions at the end. Jack. All right. Well, thank you very much, Roman. Um, very, very educational, very informative discussion. Before we move on to our next presenter, we have a little bit of an interactive activity here. So you can see a poll on your screen. I'm going to launch this poll to the attendees. So you should be able in a second here to vote. So um, I'll, I'll leave this up for about 30 seconds. And I see the results coming in already. So that's great. Um, so you can take a look through that. Uh, just let us know which IoT vertical is of primary interest to you. We've got smart cities, smart offices and buildings, smart homes, oil and gas, smart agriculture, and smart industry. I'll give you guys maybe about 10 more seconds for those of you who are logged on via the computer. Uh, just kind of a, a interesting, interesting data collection exercise here for us. So thank you very much for your feedback. I'm going to close it in five, four, three, two, one. Thank you. And I'm just going to share it so you guys can see, see the results there that you gave us. So that's outstanding. Thank you very much. It, it, there's actually quite a, quite a big, uh, uh, quite a big variety. I, I expected to see maybe one of the verticals being uh, quite a bit higher, but um, so yeah, thank you for that. Now, before we move on to the next presenter, um, I just want to circle back. Vivek, are you online and able to, to speak? Hey, uh, Jack, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Great. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just quickly scroll back through and um, we will, we will um, let you uh, get started with Semtech's piece of the presentation. All right, perfect. Uh, apologies, everyone. Uh, had some technical challenges earlier beyond my control. Uh, hopefully, it'll work this time around. Um, so if you can go to the next slide, uh, Jack. 
So LoRa today is uh, synonymous with long range, right? If you've been keeping up with uh, the headlines that, that grab attention, uh, you'll see a couple of these. You, some of you may have seen this. Uh, there was a satellite link um, for which went thousands of miles using LoRa modulation. Uh, and then there was also an experiment where, you know, from a hot air balloon, um, they are traveling across Europe, the gateway about 437 miles away uh, could pick up a signal. Uh, but real world deployments uh, that we see in smart cities, in, uh, in smart ag, in supply chain logistics, uh, it's in a very, very uh, different uh, environment, um, less than ideal conditions. So we're surrounded by you know, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, cellular, uh, a whole bunch of RF noise. And, and signals don't really uh, travel hundreds or thousands of miles from these IoT sensors. So one of the benefits of uh, LoRa, in addition to the long range, is actually good performance uh, in the presence of RF noise. Uh, and LoRa signals can be reliably uh, recovered uh, at a fraction of the power of other technologies which extends battery life uh, and also ensures that the packets can be reliably received by gateways and sent on to the, to the network. Uh, next slide. So a little bit about Semtech. Uh, we've been in the business of low power IC design for several decades, uh, for over 60 years now. Uh, we were a founding member of the LoRa Alliance, which is a global alliance of uh, over 500 members uh, dedicated to open standards and uh, interoperable LoRa WAN devices. And we brought LoRa radio technology to the market uh, in the form of silicon, uh, both for sensors and for gateways. Next slide. So we believe that LoRa actually enables um, a lot of different use cases and applications. And we serve a segment of the market uh, called LP WAN, so low power wide area networks. Uh, and we see uh, devices, which all the sensors collecting data. Uh, we see networks, which are the gateways, and, and you need network infrastructure to kind of collect data from uh, the sensors around us. Uh, and then the application side, uh, which is what the gateways do. They pass the data from sensors uh, to the application or to the service provider who then uses it. Uh, and then, of course, you've got the data analytics piece where you can make more intelligent decisions and take action. Uh, based on that data. So we believe LoRa technology is a key enabler and is the DNA of IoT. Next slide. So a little bit about the LP1 market. Um, we've seen a lot of market research reports, you know, talking to customers, looking at deployments in different uh, segments. Uh, LP1 itself, uh, it's a big number over five years, right? We expect about a billion units a year uh, in the next five years. Uh, many of the deployments today tend to be in the energy space. And when I say energy, uh, it's generally in the meter reading, utility kind of area. Um, but we also see a lot of trials and deployments today in uh, logistics, uh, smart buildings, in the consumer space. Uh, and I think there's going to be a lot of applications that we don't know about uh, in the coming years, which will all you know, uh, build up to the, to the billion, dollar, billion unit number. Uh, so this is a large opportunity for all of us. It's, uh, it's growing quite steadily, and uh, we see many good use cases, which I'll talk about next. Next slide, Jack. So uh, to realize the full potential of the LP1 market, right, you need to have a strong foundation to drive future growth. Uh, and we look at several different metrics to ensure that we have sustainable growth and we're setting the foundation uh, for all of us uh, to grow this market. So if you look at the gateways, we have about 70,000 uh, gateways uh, as of last year deployed, uh, which offers capacity of over 300 million units. So plenty of capacity uh, for the sensors that are out there. We have networks in 56 countries with over 80 different network operators. And there are many, many more private network deployments as well. Uh, so, so overall on the network infrastructure side, which is extremely important, uh, we see really good growth. Uh, we have 50 million connected devices uh, actually deployed today. So the technology is proven and accepted uh, around the world. And the LoRa Alliance ecosystem of uh, 500 companies 
uh, is also been growing uh, really, really nicely. So we've got an incredible foundation uh, to drive the future growth. So on the gateways, um, we started off with the outdoor gateways, and I think Roman covered, uh, you know, 64 channel gateways. Uh, we at Semtech, we call it the macro cell. So these are gateways that could go on uh, building tops, uh, they could go on cell towers, but we also see uh, interesting use cases that require deep indoor uh, propagation of the signals. So a lot of these sensors may be in underground uh, garages, they may be behind pipes uh, or in elevator shafts, areas where other home technologies don't really have access to things like Wi-Fi and Bluetooth or shorter range. So we see a lot of sensors being built out for both indoor and outdoor use cases. And one of the benefits of going with uh, LoRaWAN and LoRa is that you can deploy either a, uh, a higher capacity, more robust kind of outdoor gateway, or you could have a much simpler indoor, you know, eight channel PicoCell gateway deployed uh, locally in your facility. Uh, so overall, you know, combined, we see tremendous growth, uh, about 200% in a year. Uh, and we see a lot of good applications, both indoor and outdoor. Next slide. So connectivity is key, and we talked about LoRa, and it is a connectivity uh, technology, but it's all about solutions, right? It's all about the problems that we're trying to solve. So if you look at the vertical segments where the technology lends itself well to, <clears throat> we've got the energy and utility segment, uh, primarily you know, smart meters and monitoring utility assets. Uh, we have smart city applications, such as waste management, parking sensors, and such. Uh, smart home and building, uh, sensors for temperature monitoring uh, or structural integrity monitoring. Uh, and then we've got opportunities in connected insurance, uh, supply chain logistics to know where things are. <clears throat> and then in the smart farming area with uh, precision farming and uh, cattle management. So uh, across all of these, there is a common theme though. We believe that you know, there's gonna be about between 60 to 70% of applications across these segments where sensors will need to be location aware, uh, network operators and service providers will, will really benefit from knowing where the sensors are. Uh, maybe you wanna address a failure in a certain location. Uh, you wanna use uh, geolocation for geofencing applications. Uh, so I think asset management is kind of a big theme across all these segments as well. Uh, I think uh, Senate is gonna cover that a little bit when they talk about use cases. Next slide. So this webinar is about carrier grade quality, and uh, this is really important, right? IoT devices, we, we do require and expect 24 seven on time, uh, just like we expect cellular connectivity. Uh, if you think about Wi-Fi or Bluetooth devices that are much more accessible, uh, you can easily hit a reset button, unplug power and power it back in and do all those things. Uh, but with IoT sensors, IoT gateways, it's really not an easy thing to do. It's extremely expensive to actually touch a sensor once it's deployed. Uh, so this becomes really important. We need these sensors to last uh, over 10 years uh, on a single battery without replacement uh, and be on 24 seven. So the carrier grade uh, aspect is extremely important when we think of IoT, uh, regardless of whether it's in a kind of a home or building environment or in an outdoor smart city setting. Next slide. So if you want additional information, uh, Semtech hosts the LoRa community website. It's a fantastic resource for information on uh, LoRa WAN products, uh, on services. Uh, you have access to technical support forums if you have any technical questions. And there's also many use case uh, documents and briefs showing benefits uh, to business owners of deploying LoRa. Next slide. And, and finally, to, to wrap up this section, you know, we've got uh, proven long range technology, the sensors, gateways and solutions are available today. Uh, so it's not something you, you have to wait for in the future. Uh, it's endorsed by uh, over 500 companies as part of the LoRa Alliance. Uh, we have strong and sustainable growth. And we really believe that carrier grade networks and ease of use are keys to success. And, and that's kind of our focus area uh, for the coming year. Thanks. With that said, I'll hand it back to Jack. 
All right, thank you very much, Vivek. Uh, very informative discussion there. We have a, another poll question that we're going to be launching here for you guys. I'll leave it up for about 30 seconds, just like the last time. So there we go. So what areas should the industry focus on to accelerate time to market? Longer battery life of sensors, secure key management and provisioning, turnkey sensor reference designs, global roaming between networks, remote device management, communication of use cases and benefits. So I see the answers starting to fly in here. So that's great. I'll leave it up for about another 10 seconds and then we'll share the results with you guys. So we'll leave it about five, four, three, two, one. There we go, and there's the results. So it's split uh, very, very evenly. So that's uh, very interesting. Thank you all very much for your feedback. Um, we are now going to move to our last presenter of the day, who I introduced earlier in the presentation was Steve Ball from Senate. Uh, so Steve, whenever you're ready, I will pass the controls over to you and it's all yours. Thanks, Jack. So I will be challenged here to, uh, to, to try to respect the time here. So let me jump right into introducing Senate. Uh, Jack, if you could close that poll, maybe I can do that. Ah, okay. So hopefully most of you have heard of Senate before and perhaps you know us uh, most as a, as a carrier, a uh, lower WAN network operator. And, um, Arguably, we have the, the greatest depth of experience in the world as a carrier class LoRaWAN network operator, but uh, it's also important to understand that we are first and foremost a cloud-based software and services company. Uh, our own uh, LoRa backend, the Senate Operation Support System and Business Support System software is part of Senate's key intellectual property. And we also have a, a rich uh, suite of services offerings from consulting through deployment related services that we consider to be a key value add in our offering. So from a product perspective, of course, the first sub bullet there talks about network as a service as, as a fundamental offering uh, of our network. Um, but uh, we've gone beyond that to offer managed network services for IoT um, such that yeah. Operators anywhere in the world who want to become LoRaWAN operators can do so quite rapidly and, and with low initial investment by way of using our managed network services uh, software. Uh, we have also gotten more creative over time in terms of how we're going to continue to fuel the, the rapid expansion and ubiquitous coverage uh, required for LoRaWAN networks and RAN operator services is one piece of that uh, strategy where we uh, incentivize uh, those with assets and those willing to provide their own gateways by way of discounting. Um, and this last bullet called the LQN virtual network is really a very key uh, strategy and key concept. The LVN is actually already winning awards um, for its technology and, and strategy. But the intent is to enable customers to create one real, one business relationship or one bill with their local preferred operator and be able to connect to their devices anywhere in the world where there is a Senate enabled network. So this enables seamless roaming and again is a key strategy for delivering ubiquitous network coverage. So let's see, Jack, I'm not able to move forward. Oh, maybe I am. Here I am. So uh, actually Roman from Tectolic already gave you a, a network architecture review, so I won't spend any more time on this, I think, other than to point out that once again, all this technology in the cloud on the left is Senate specific value add and key intellectual property for us. Um, additionally, we, uh, we have several, we have a development platform and a production environment as well, which is pre-integrated to many popular IoT platforms. Uh, to facilitate your application rollouts. I'm going to speed right on ahead. <clears throat> so back again to this, this concept of the LVN and the LPWA virtual network. 
this is all about how <clears throat> how can we help facilitate the various players in the ecosystem to be able to participate in this service economy. And certainly there are different kinds of challenges and opportunities for all the various players in the ecosystem here rep represented in this, uh, in this circle. So <clears throat> we believe that the LVN is really the solution framework for enabling easier access to the IoT value proposition. I already gave the example of RAN providers. Uh, let's say you're a, a regional operator with, with uh, tower assets. While you're out there climbing towers anyway, you can take these very inexpensive LoRa gateways, certainly in a, in, inexpensive compared to cellular gateways, put them up on your towers and already start to capture a revenue share opportunity. Uh, other, uh, even um, solution vendors can provide their own gateways and, and, and receive up to a 40% rebate on their data services charges. So um, the intention really here is to, to leverage multiple capabilities and techniques for enabling all these constituents in the, in the services economy. Um, the, the image on the right comes from our website. You can see more information about coverage but it's important to understand, of course, we were first established in North America and we have lots of active deployments in North America. You may also notice uh, out here to the right, uh, some more green in India where, yeah, where we have one of our partners operating Senate networks there. Um, but we also have um, channel plan support uh, in all of the regions across the world today. So if you're a uh, uh, an operator interested in becoming a lower WAN operator, we can enable you there. If you're a solution vendor uh, who wants to deploy enterprise networks in, in any of these locations, then we have uh, channel plan support uh, to go to market together with you. I want to get uh, kind of speeding along here a little bit. I want to show a few deployment examples on the, uh, on the operator side, but also get into a little Bit of discussion on use cases. So a couple of quick examples here. The first one I mentioned already in, in India, the company is called Senra. They're a startup company uh, using our managed network services software. And they were able to uh, start their first deployments less than 90 days after signing on with Senate. And it's still less than one year from their initial deployment, but they've already deployed in 17 markets uh, in India. So uh, a good testament to, uh, to the ease of, of deployment with, with our capabilities. Um, second kind of category is regional operators, again, who, who may have uh, uh, tower assets or other assets to, to bring to bear. Um, Inland Cellular is a good example. They, they're a, a regional operator in, in Idaho and uh, Washington State, and they've already begun to, to deploy uh, Senate-enabled uh, gateways in their environments to expand uh, their coverage and be able to capture IoT application revenue in their region. And similarly, a company called Knet or Quaynet rather in Canada uh, has also begun to uh, support LoRaWAN to, uh, to for tank monitoring uh, use cases and fuel delivery services across Canada. As I switch more into um, the end user use case um, aspects, uh, we, you know, I think Vivek um, introduced that asset tracking is really a key um, use case uh, that applies to many, many verticals. And LoRaWAN is has some uh, very nice characteristics to fit well with these with these solutions: the need for long battery life, the support for mobility. Um, multi-function sensors that are quite low cost, many getting as low as 20 or 30 or $40 per device to allow uh, the deployment of massive volumes of these devices. Um, the ability for different kinds of geolocation techniques to be leveraged, we're seeing interesting combinations. And obviously people have started with GPS enabled devices, but um, Indoor asset tracking technologies are leveraging Wi-Fi beacons and Bluetooth beacons. And there are even hybrid products now that are doing combination indoor and outdoor uh, asset tracking kinds of use cases in a single device, which is 
extremely interesting, all being backhauled over lower wing connections. Um, this, this area is in fact so interesting to us that uh, the Senate is doing some additional enablement work to pre-qualify devices and to build other device management feature and function into, um, into our offering to help simplify uh, access um, to the data streams and simplify deployments of solutions in, in the field. So moving to a bit more um, specific examples, um, I probably don't have an opportunity to go through all of these quick, but uh, let me focus on the upper left there with the municipal asset tracking. This is kind of an interesting one in that uh, in a major city in the U.S., um, there was legislation that was driving this business case for municipal asset tracking, where uh, they have a ton of food carts and food trucks uh, that need to be uh, inspected. Um, so the Department of Health had a major initiative here and was really unable to, uh, to, to manage uh, the, the full solution themselves and were challenged by the costs for cellular. And so we partnered with a, a system integrator and we designed, developed, integrated, implemented a full asset tracking solution to give real-time views of the mobile food vendor locations with GPS maps for asset location, providing alerts, battery monitoring, et cetera. Um, and they were able to save more than 75% on data transmission costs alone and, of course, uh, improve the, the health and safety of their local citizenry. So you may see other ones here that are more interesting to you, and uh, we'd be happy to talk about those um, in the future. Um, okay. So just uh, quickly in closing here, again, we think, uh, at least we're attempting uh, to provide enablement for each of these categories and each of these uh, players in the, in, the, in the ecosystem from operators to solution vendors to integrators and infrastructure providers. Uh, and finally, just a quick plug for our development services. We have, um, you can see the link on the bottom there, portal.senecode.io. We offer a free developer portal access where you can register up to 10 devices for free and understand uh, what you can do in the development environment and how quickly, how quick and easy it is to onboard a device onto the world. I'm going to turn it back to you, Jack, for uh, for your final poll question. All right, thank you very much, Steve. Um, I'm just going to scroll here. So we have one more poll question for you guys today. So here it is. I'm going to launch it and send it. Poll. There we go. So what do you feel is the biggest hurdle to deploying an IoT solution commercially? Available end devices, network coverage, application readiness, finding the right set of partners to work with, budget and resources. <clears throat> so I'll give you guys about 10 more seconds. While you're answering this poll, uh, I do apologize that we went over a little bit. Um, there's, there's some technical glitches that uh, caused that to be the case, but we will stay on the line here to answer some, some of the questions that have been coming through. So for those of you who are able to, to stay with us, thank you for that. Hopefully we can provide you with some additional insight. For those of you who are not, uh, I, I would of course like to just thank you for for uh, joining us this morning or this afternoon or this evening, wherever you happen to be. We hope that uh, this was a valuable use of your time where you received some insightful information. I'm going to end the poll and share the results. So there we go. So again, uh, we're our three polls today, we've been very split right down the middle. Uh, I would like to thank all of you for participating in these little small exercises. This this insight is very valuable to us, and um, it, it's not very often that we have a platform such as this to to gather kind of live feedback and live opinions about about these sort of topics. So so thank you very much. I am going to now. Uh, read a few of the questions that have come through over the last hour or so. Um, and any of the panelists, feel free to uh, open up your microphones and, 
and answer um, if you if you feel that it's a, a good one for you to answer. So the first question is is as follows. Um, can one of the panelists identify the differences in their opinion on Laura Wan versus LTEM or LPWA, et cetera? One of the panelists want to take this one. I'll jump in. This is Steve from Senate. Okay. Um, I was expecting Vivek to jump in immediately, so I, I hesitated. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, this obviously there's uh, there could be a very long answer to this kind of a question. Um, we look at um, so at the surface, at least LTEM is a licensed technology, whereas LoRaWAN runs on unlicensed spectrum. So that's a, a clear difference. Um, LTEM. Also, we believe has much less uh, battery performance, battery life performance than uh, than LoRaWAN does. So, in general, you know there are various solutions in the low power wide area networking space. The ones most commonly talked about in unlicensed are Sigfox and LoRaWAN, uh, and most commonly in licensed spectrum, there would be LTEM and uh, narrowband IoT, also called NB-IoT. Uh, so NB-IoT compared to LTEM is a, is a bit more battery efficient, um, but in both cases, the licensed solutions are expected to be uh, more expensive due to the more expensive infrastructure and the cost of spectrum, and probably will then be more suitable for cases where quality of service is a, is a very important requirement, whereas uh, the unlicensed spectrum solutions like LoRaWAN with its great battery performance and great range, um, also should drive much lower overall communication costs. Thank you very much for that, Steve. All right, thank you, Steve. Um, there's a few more questions that have come through. Um, is there anybody, Vivek, are you still on the line? For, for Semtech? Hey, Jack. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, so this one is uh, specifically for Semtech, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you this one. It's about, is gateway geolocation features for sensors highly dependent on indoor-outdoor environment, and has Semtech done any studies about this? Yeah, so the gateway geolocation, now geolocation with uh, the way we do it, the position is... Um, comes from the network where there's kind of a solver uh, that takes in the time difference of arrival of signals coming in from sensors. And then it calculates the position and then sends that back uh, to a dashboard and you get your blue dot on a map. Um, now, LoRa, the way, if you use just LoRa radio, uh, given the bandwidth and the technology itself, uh, it's good for primarily outdoor uh, applications where you're trying to do maybe geofencing or locate assets outdoor uh, within a, you know, 50 to 150 meters, uh, depending on the density of gateways and, and many other factors. Uh, there is a geolocation uh, white paper that is available on the LoRa Alliance website. And uh, we've got some additional material on uh, the Semtech community site as well, if you want to check that out. Thank you very much, Vivek. Uh, I'm going to ask one more here, and we'll see if there's a panelist who would like to jump in. It says, "Which are the main? What are the main challenges to the integration of RF mixed signal applications or gateway functions inside a systems package for smaller form factor applications?" Is there somebody who wants to jump okay, in on that um, one? I'll I'll try. Um, okay. So. I think uh, gateways typically uh, for the indoor gateways, think of it of maybe like a Wi-Fi access point type size. Uh, and the outdoor ones are, are certainly slightly bigger in size. So I think they're not generally space constrained on the, on the gateway side. Um, there are small modules and small form factor designs done, uh, but they're nowhere near as small as the sensors. 
Uh, on the sensors, there are system and package uh, solutions available. There are modules available uh, where you have a uh, LoRa radio uh, with a microcontroller from some company. And uh, these SIPs are, you know, depending on how it's architected, uh, either in a stack die approach or, or how it's laid out, um, they're anywhere in the, I'd say typically in the eight by eight or nine by nine millimeter uh, size. Uh, so there's many ways you can do it. Uh, generally, space is not uh, a big constraint uh, because sub gigahertz antennas as well uh, require more space uh, than some of the higher frequency bands. So, so that tends to be the dominant factor. Uh, I think the key is really in how you lay it out and uh, the components you want to integrate uh, into that circuit. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Vivek. I've got one more here. Um, are the vendors here today, so Senate, Semtech, and Tectelic, anybody focusing on end device management services, such as trouble resolution and firmware over the air updates? Uh, this has been known as a big barrier to, uh, for some companies to deploy common solutions on a global scale. So is there anybody focusing on end device management services, such as uh, trouble resolution or firmware over the air updates? Yeah, so I'll, I'll answer for Semtech and then maybe uh, Senate or Tectelic can, can jump in. But Semtech, you know, we are certainly focused on, uh, you know, firmware update over the air and device management. We look at it as uh, providing building blocks. So we provide the technology and kind of maybe a reference implementation. Uh, but we are certainly focused together with uh, the LoRa Alliance members. Uh, and there's a lot of activity in the Alliance in the committee meetings around these topics as well. Uh, so we're certainly focused on this area. We recognize this uh, could be a bottleneck for deployments. And it's something that pretty much all uh, sensors and networks will need. Uh, so it is, it is a focus area for us. Thank you, Vivek. I'll jump in quickly on that one. This is Steve. Um, so we... We believe firmware updates over the air are a critical requirement. Um, and certainly the LoRa Alliance has spent a lot of time defining uh, the base protocols and methodology for doing so. And Senate has invested uh, quite a bit of effort ourselves in proving out uh, implementation methodologies there. And we're currently contemplating how we can better share the, the benefit of that experience with our customers. All right, thank you very much for that one, Steve. Um, is there anyone else who would like to input on this question or I'll, I can move on to the next question? All right, so I'll move on to, I, I think we'll, we have time for uh, one more question here. So uh, with, here's the question, with my understanding that LoRaWAN would use the cellular network as the back end, are the cellular network operators cooperating to make this alliance a success or are they feeling threatened with this technology? Hi, Jack, can you hear me? Roman can answer this question. Yeah, we can hear you, Roman. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, I don't, so I believe it's very, this one is a very easy question. So today, cellular technology, we use cellular backhauls in almost all of our macro and macro, mega, and even indoor micro gateways. Well, uh, I would say it's probably 95% is used as a, a backhaul is used uh, uh, as a seller technology. Nobody sees that as a competing because in many cases, um, you know, you just, you, you're procuring effectively a SIM card for a very low data connection and you, you know, you're supporting it. The, the seller vendors do not have a choice. They have to you know, offer you that service. You're connecting to their device. It's, it'll be very much discrimination legally, so I don't think they can do that. And it's not like these networks actually consume a lot of power, a lot of the resources from them. So no, it's not. Uh, there is going to be competing technologies between NB-IoT and LoRa on a technology level, on air interface level. But I, don't, I think there's definitely going to be an element that, People will use cellular technology or even, you know, satellite technology to provide actually backhaul uh, for the for the for the LoRaWAN and other LPW technologies. And just to answer on the previous question, um, I mean, 
absolutely whoever stated the question, how do you, how do you make sure all these devices are going to be plug and play in, in really simple terms? And how do you do, you know, over the air upgrades? It's one thing to talk about over air upgrades and you where you actually push the new firmware load to the device. But because LoRa protocols are such that it uses very little, you know, throughput, you don't want to be upgrading your firmware on a device very often because, you know, you probably, if you were to upgrade the firmware on a device two, three, four, maybe five times, your battery will be dead. So, because you're using a lot of battery in that case. So it's not like firmware upgrade is an important thing, but people shouldn't think about upgrading the firmware if you actually want to reconfigure the device. So that is a very different thing. So the way Tectalic implements it, and I think we're starting to work right now, there's going to be probably, uh, you know, Samtech and other company working together. There's an element of think about it. How do you want to reconfigure the device, you know? Maybe you want to get this device reporting data not every minute, but maybe only once a day or once an hour, or you want to report a different data, you want to def set different thresholds. That should not mean over-the-air firmware download because that's, that's, a, that's a feature you can set up with the one packet, you know, one bit versus, versus actually trying to push all the, all the firmware onto the device. So um, it, it is something that needs to be done and needs to be done very well. And it needs to probably start to a degree standardized to make sure that people can have the experience where you go buy a device, get it, bring it home, power it up. And, and you should, a, a person with a very basic understanding of how computer works or how, how, to con, you know, how to get the internet should be able to configure the device. It should not be an engineer, right? You shouldn't have an engineering degree to connect a device because it will take a very long time for IoT to develop. And... I, I want to say that Tectalic and other companies are already almost there today. So it's not that difficult to do. People just have to make the right steps and take the right approach and understand how it's to be done. It's, it's been done in, for the other technologies. It's not a difficult task. But I think it's probably more important now to say, okay, let's maybe try to find a way to standardize that because there's no good if one company can do it really well because one company cannot produce all the devices anyways. It has to be a common approach you know, by the ecosystem. All right, thank you very much, Roman. Um, I'm going to give the panelists uh, one last opportunity if there's anything else that you would like to discuss or share or any comments, um, please do so now. If not, um, we will. I have some closing remarks and some, some information to give the attendees and, and we can proceed. So I'll, I'll leave it to you guys. I'll give you about 10 seconds if you have any, any closing remarks. Not for me, thanks. Yeah, me neither. Thanks, Jack. All right, so sounds like we're we're all good. So uh, this concludes the the webinar with TechTelic, Semtech, and Senate. I I truly hope that all of you were able to learn something new about our technology and how it can provide benefit to you and help you make smart decisions. I do realize that there are some outstanding questions, so I will make sure that we would go through all of those. Um, these questions may be tied to your email address if you didn't submit them anonymously, so I'll get those sent out to the team so that we can uh, get you a prompt reply. I would, I would like to give a final thank you to our three speakers today and, of course, a big thank you to all of the attendees who joined. Um, if you have any follow-up questions or comments, feel free to reach out to us at the emails on your screen. Uh, you can also find me on LinkedIn and I'll be happy to chat with you there. We will be distributing a thank you email to all of you shortly with some additional information of how to get in touch. I appreciate all of you taking the time to join us today. I look forward to the opportunity to either work with you in the future, have a discussion or debate, or perhaps even present to you again. Uh, we will, of course, reach out with information about our next webinar event when that becomes available. And finally, in closing, I would like to mention that all three of TechTelic, Semtech, and Senate will be at Mobile World Congress in Los Angeles on September 12th to the 14th. We would love uh, for you guys to uh, stop by for a chat if you're at the show as well. So please reach out to uh, either myself or, or, or Vivek or Steve um, to get information about where we will be located and um, perhaps arrange a meeting. And we would be happy to continue this discussion with you in Los Angeles. So that's it for me. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you for, for joining 
Um, thank you for your participation with the polls and thank you for your patience while we, while we work through some technical results but, or technical difficulties. But I, I feel that the, this was a very uh, beneficial webinar for everybody and I, I appreciate all of you for, for logging in. Thank you very much.